Greetings, folks. Thank you for tuning in here today. It's good to have you here. I'm Henrik from Sweden, and this is Red Ice Radio. I hope you're having a good week so far. The website where you can find more shows, news, and videos is redicecreations.com. And uh, today here we have a history lesson for you, another one of those items that we think it's really important to address due to the fact that it is suppressed and neglected. Tremendously important, in fact, for the sake of historical accuracy and what is going on today. We'll be talking about white slavery, something that is never discussed and put in the proper context. And uh, with us to bring light to this subject that has been hiding in the shadows for way too long is Michael Hoffman, a uh, former reporter for the Associated Press and the author of six books on radical history, journalism and literature. He uh, describes himself as a heretical writer. Hoffman is the managing editor of the newsletter Revisionist History. And his book that we'll be discussing today is called They Were White and They Were Slaves. And welcome back, Michael Hoffman. It's uh, excellent to have you here again. Thank you for coming on. It's always a pleasure speaking with you. Hope you're doing well today. Thank you very much for having me, Henry. You bet. Well, today we're going to talk about your book, They Were White and They Were Slaves, the untold history of the enslavement of whites in early America. And this is, I mean, such a hidden and, and, and neglected subject. I mean, I couldn't believe it myself when I started uh, coming on to some of the work on this, including your book on the subject, of course. Uh, this is a historical cover-up, no, no questions about there, that has uh, certainly been a myopic view on history solely, in some cases, divided on racial lines uh, by the corporate media and the opportunists in, in government, I'd say as well, who seeks to use uh, some of this to fulfill their own political agendas. But uh, the book has been out for many years now, Michael, back in uh, you know mid, mid to early 90s was released. So I hope we can refresh your memory here a bit as well. But tell us first why you wanted to write this book and why you think it's an important subject. Well, it was basically uh, the issue of hypocrisy. I start out the book with a quote from Shakespeare, now step I forth to whip hypocrisy. And that's really what it is, the overwhelming emphasis on uh, black chattel enslavement, which I don't wish to minimize what happened to black people in the Western Hemisphere in terms of their enslavement is a horror. Uh, but my concern is with filling in uh, a gap, and that gap is the equal horror of white enslavement and the fact that s many of the people who were involved in liberating uh, black people from slavery were also implicated in the enslavement of blacks or, or and, excuse me, in the enslavement of whites or turning a blind eye to the enslavement of whites. For example, the 19th century Victorian campaigners in Great Britain uh, who uh, Charles Dickens lampooned in his book uh, Bleak House, which he called uh, telescopic philanthropists, in that they could they could see the misery of blacks in Africa or in the U.S., but they couldn't see the misery of their own poor whites right underneath their windowsills. And this was a great concern of Charles Dickens. He had very little use for the politically correct attitudes that we have today. And I'm often surprised when the BBC inserts uh, black actresses playing white parts in Dickens novels in the programs that they broadcast, yeah. uh, he would have had a strong objection to this. And let's not be faint-hearted when we discuss aspects of this. These were men of their time, certainly, perhaps captive to the zeitgeist, but nonetheless, let's bear uh, witness to what they actually represented so that if we admire Dickens for his great literary abilities, perhaps we should also explore his political and uh, moral understandings of these situations. So Dickens was uh, a great one for underscoring this hypocrisy and Granville Sharp in the realm of what I hope to get into later on in the broadcast, the uh, impressment of white slaves aboard British naval and maritime vessels. Granville Sharp was also someone who underscored this hypocrisy. So that was really the main thing and also the crippling effects of guilt on white people who are told that they are the heirs and the descendants of these horrible people who enslaved the blacks. Well, what about the whites themselves who are being targeted in this fashion? And they are actually the descendants of white slaves, yeah. especially here in North America, and they're not even aware of it. Absolutely, exactly. It's uh, it, it opens up this debate in a completely different way. Certainly later, I want to talk more about how this is being used you know, today and for what reason and whatnot. There's a very important aspect to this and how this is... Uh, changing the, the the landscape in your view uh, 
in terms of uh, you know race relations in America and all that who that has been uh, intensified I, I think really over the years here but I mean, all of you focus, and we'll get to that later, but all of you focus on, on the Americas quite a bit in the book, and, and obviously uh, the origin point of this being the British uh, Empire and all that, and, and their expansion phase. One thing we sh- I think we should talk about first is, of course, the most obvious point, which also is neglected, that basically every single human culture, as far as I've been able to tell, uh, every single race uh, in, in some capacity or another have held... Uh, slaves, they've, uh, you know, conquered people, they've taken over territories, they've fought over resources, uh, etc. This has been a, a constant throughout human history, universal experience of all people. Uh, in fact, as you describe in the beginning of your book, uh, even, of course, White's um, uh, origin of the name and all that comes from the, the Slavs, but maybe we can just talk about the history overall of the institution of slavery first to kind of set the groundwork a little bit. Well, I think that that history is first and foremost one of betrayal. It's often forgotten or passed over marginally that it was black slavers in Africa who were merchandising their fellow Africans to the white slavers. And by the same token, uh, in my book, I point out the extent to which the Vikings, for example, uh, took, as you say, the Slavs, from which we derive the word slave. Uh, out of Eastern Europe, yep. and also within Viking culture, which in many other respects is, of course, admirable. But in Viking culture, you had an entire classification of villainage, of churl. I'm using terms that would develop later in Anglo-Saxon England, but nonetheless, you had a notion of thralls, for example, which were hereditary slaves, and then you had uh, churls, which were the lowest class of free whites. They were free, but they were denigrated. And then the villains who would have a status very much like the serfs. And this was institutionalized. And as you say, it's institutionalized in Greco-Roman culture, for example. Uh, The Romans were vicious slavers. Um, A great deal of the slave culture of the American South was, was taken and adapted from the Romans. And, of course, even going into the Old Testament, the King James Bible incorrectly, in most cases, translates the word uh, slave as servant. And this is why, for example, when we read in many of the diaries and um, primary research about colonial America, we will see white slaves referred to as servants. And this this is due to the fact that uh, that was the word for slave in the Old Testament. But The Old Testament condones uh, enslavement of peoples for various reasons, which I won't go into because it's a theological issue. And even in the New Testament, uh, there is certainly an underlying current of slaves being faithful to their masters until such time as they obtain Christian masters who would, in a humanitarian gesture, release them. But that was in no way incumbent on them. So I, I myself am very much opposed to all forms of uh, human servitude and bondage, and I'm not trying to justify it, but I am trying to point out that this is a history, and where, where it becomes really hypocritical is this incredible media and academic bias in favor of the British Empire, and which has the British as the heroes uh, of the, in the fight against slavery, again, reducing it uh, to uh, solely to the extent of black slavery. But this is really a laugh. I mean, I can only give a laugh to the notion like that from the rise of the Protestant Empire in Great Britain, uh, beginning really in earnest with the ascension of Queen Elizabeth I. Uh, she had uh, a whole core of, of uh, slavers who are often honored as being the great seamen, and they were great seamen and great navigators, And they're the ones who really began to institute the theft of black people, the kidnapping of black people out of uh, Africa. At the same time, because of the precedent for impressment, in other words, conking a a white farmer or laborer or generally the poor and working class of Great Britain over the head or otherwise abducting them onto ships. And this is an old precedent in Great Britain out of that came the kidnapping of whites. And so there was very little uh, to distinguish the two forms of servitude until we came into the politically correct era, which I would say really began in the Victorian age when the British attempted to have bragging rights uh, for their alleged emancipation of slaves. But that was limited entirely to 
uh, black slaves. And since they had instituted it, it was not the United States of America, but rather Great Britain and the Crown that had instituted it, then I don't really see how they do have those bragging rights. And as we talk later on in the broadcast, the horrors that were being visited on white people at the same time that uh, there was this boasting about the liberality of the British Crown and the British Empire is really disgusting, in my view. Hmm. Very interesting. Uh, you know, we've never heard about this before, but what was the divide here then? I mean, how, how do, as we said, this is an ancient institution. It wasn't, I mean, today we have a view that, oh, okay, it was done on, we, we're, it seems like we're dividing everything on racial lines today because it's uh, within the context of, w you know, what is, uh, you know, the, the, the moral uh, issues of the day kind of thing. But how, how did people become enslaved and, and, and what was the uh, criteria for this and how could they get away with it if we look at, let's say, Great Britain primarily, who of course were, uh, it, it goes further back than that, I know that, but we have a lot of issues of, for example, the enclosure movement and things like that, that actually drove people off the land, putting them in a position which we've, I think, never even seen before, it seems like, uh, where they no longer could take care of themselves, they, they indeed became dependent upon society and you got these massive uh, you know, poor people basically roaming around in the cities and whatnot. I don't know, I don't know if I'm jumping away of ahead of myself there, Michael, but uh, uh, how, how did people become enslaved? Well, the idea that Great Britain had a dark age, when people refer to the medieval period as the dark ages, I really think that that's a sign of indoctrination because there was so much that was good about the medieval period that has been lost to us. And part of that was is the concept of the yeoman in Anglo-Saxon England, which was carried over under the Normans to a certain extent. And that was is that the poor man or the man who was the worker, the farmer, the shepherd, had tremendous value in and of himself. After all, we were talking about the Vikings, but it was under King Alfred the Great relying on this yeomanry that was finally able to uh, uh, fight the Vikings to a standstill and then work out a peace with them. And, and he, uh, Alfred, was very aware of how much he needed uh, the English working class uh, to assist him in that regard. So they're really responsible for the freedom that Anglo-Saxon uh, England was able to win. And as a, par as a part of that, and as well as the dignity which Christianity had conferred on the individual, you had people in the Middle Ages who talked of the fact that they had good wool clothing, they had good beer and good cheese and good bread. And part of that came from the fact that you had the, um, you had the policy of the commons. And the commons was a certain amount of land that was left open uh, for grazing purposes for anyone who had a small holding. They might have a half an acre, they might have a cow, they might have some other uh, horse that needed grazing. And so on these commons, the peasants could gather together, uh, their uh, cow could get the grass, and they could live at least a minimum standard of decency in their lives. And, uh, the, you know, in the American West, the, the, it's often... Uh, rhapsodized about the closing of the American West when they fenced in the West. And so the commons was even part and parcel of the legend of the American West in terms of how we have romanticized it. When the barbed wire was put up and the cattle were no longer free to roam, uh, many Americans lamented that as a closing of a great epic in our country. But again, we're ignorant of the fact that there was this concept of the commons in Great Britain and uh, as capitalism arose as an institution, I'm not talking here about free enterprise, which existed yeah. in medieval England, but uh, I'm talking about rapacious capitalism, predatory capitalism. These commons were then seized, and part of the precedent was Henry VIII's seizure of the monasteries. Uh, the monasteries, I'm sure there were corrupt monks, I'm sure there were abuses of every kind, but at the same time, the monasteries uh, were part of the engine of Anglo-Saxon freedom. They were, uh, they pioneered hospitals. They pioneered uh, scientific experimentation with plants and chemicals. And they served as a redoubt when uh, people were under attack. And of course, as a spiritual uh, beacon to people. And uh, Henry VIII and his greed, uh, wanting to secure for himself a firm purchase over the people of Great Britain and in his government, he seized those monasteries and then distributed their vast wealth among his barons, who you could say in some respects were really little more than gangsters. Uh, 
And that precedent, which was was really a, a revolutionary illegal move, I believe then led to the a further tyranny, which we saw emerging with Elizabeth I. There had been some uh, enclosures prior to her, but with Elizabeth I, we saw a very radical move against the commons. And that's where we saw the emergence of a pauper class. Now these people no longer could have access to the commons for their livestock, and they were eventually impoverished. And typically when people, rural people are impoverished, where do they go? They go to the great cities like London, where they became the prostitutes, the pickpockets, and what was regarded as a criminal underclass. And this word criminal which is really just a euphemism for poor whites who had been oppressed in this regard, is used over and over again in the annals of white slavery to justify what would happen in the coming, in the coming centuries. So that's, that's a brief survey of how we see the artificial creation of a poverty-stricken class, which was denigrated institutionally, looked on as sort of a species of subhuman, and from there, you could begin the abduction process, which would become the main uh, tra- belt of transmission for slavery into the uh, into 17th and 18th century America. Very good. Now, so this, in effect, to a certain degree, was uh, not only the c- the creation of a poor class; it was the beginning of a of a war on them, the poor the pauper class, as you say. But this is, of course, how many Irish, Scots, uh, poor Englishmen ended up in the American colonies. Uh, even down to you know areas like Barbados, I, I believe even we can talk about that later, but Australia and New Zealand as well to a certain degree. But uh, in in my view, as I was reading a book, this was a measure to try to to get rid of them. And the, so the the question here is, of course, okay, with the creation of this class, was this a an unintended side effect, or was this something that was sought to be achieved so that they indeed could kind of uh, colonize their colonies, for lack of a better term? Well, I think it was unintended because there's an old saying by some British general. He was asked whether or not his uh, his English troops would terrify the enemy, and he said, uh, "I don't know, but by God, they terrify me." Um, I mean, there you have a very sturdy stock of people there uh, among the Anglo-Saxon and and later peoples of England, and they represented a revolutionary potential. You didn't have a true revolution against the monarchy until the 17th century. Uh, with the rise of the Puritan Republic, which cut off the head of Charles I. But you had that potential ever since uh, the enclosures and the impover- the institutional impoverishment of these English people, who were also reproducing at a high rate. Uh, it's not like today where people have one or two children and think that's a big family. Uh, the I mean, completed family size might be eight or ten, but you know, the typical person would have 15 or 20 uh, if they could survive childbirth. And then... Yeah, yeah. And, But uh, so, no, this was an enormous potential for revolution. That's what they feared. They saw it as a population explosion and they had to do a sweep. They had to sweep these people off the streets, onto the ships and out of there. And I think if they had not done that, then some type of personality, another Alfred the Great or Robin Hood uh, or uh, Braveheart type of personality could have come up and organized those people uh, you know, the English in this era were had an affinity for aristocracy, and I don't say that aristocracy is wrong in all cases, even though I'm a traditional American and therefore I favor republic. But I believe an aristocracy, an aristocracy should be an aristocracy of merit. It should be yeah. a natural aristocracy and not this kind of vampiric aristocracy, which to this day survives in Great Britain and works against the interests of the English people, even though they've been manipulated. And and some of the best conservative forces in Great Britain continue to support the monarchy because of the ways in which they've been manipulated by a very brilliant, very brilliant British Secret Service over there. No doubt about that. Yep, definitely. I I definitely agree. A natural aristocracy. I I believe there is such a thing. But so the just to clarify this point again here, the aristocratic class and the merchants who had the infrastructure in place and the ability to uh you know perform uh the, the these uh transpositions of people etc it's not an an idea of where they go they go out and look for people who have a different skin color and consequently take as many of those as they can and put them in these uh colonies to uh to, to work the fields etc this it's a very different uh kind of scenario that arise of you know from from this from learning this kind of knowledge here but so 
what are we talking about in terms of numbers, uh, Michael? Do we have any idea here in terms of how many uh, people were taken from the British Isles and ended, ended up the Ameri- in the Americas and in other parts of the world? That's very difficult to say. I can give an estimate for the number of people from, say, 1688 until when oppressment ended in the uh, toward the end of the 19th century in terms of abducting people on board ships. That's about 50 percent of all the men who served on board those ships because some records are kept. And so it's about 500,000 sailors, so about 250,000 uh, were abducted. It's much more difficult in this case because and what we're referring to in terms of the peopling of British America with white slaves, because it was an enormous embarrassment to the white aristocracy and ruling class that this was even happening. And that's why it's been so difficult to research this and get to the bottom of it. It's heavily covered up, especially in terms of euphemisms. For example, the euf- the prime euphemism of indentured servitude, when it was actually, uh, it could be, uh, and slavery for life, particularly in the 17th century, what I would say is, is that we are looking at numbers as high as 100,000 uh, at the very least and tens of thousands more once the dumping ground of uh, British America ended with the success of the American Revolution. Then the tyrants had to turn to Australia. There are better records for that. That's more disputed. And it's not my specialty uh, like this area is, but I would certainly say that many tens of thousands of whites were enslaved in Australia as well. So we're talking about very high figures for the time, 100,000 or more at least, but it's very difficult to say, and I'm loath to give a figure because the records are poor. I've had some genealogists come forward. They use my book as a handbook to trace their their, uh, forefathers in America They've given me some information, but I would reluctant to really put a figure on it. But I would say it's massive in comparison with the number of people. Certainly, I, I, I really feel that you've got at least one third of the people of 17th and 18th century British America having an unfree background. And also, we have to realize that this changes with each century. In the 17th century, This was a very intense phenomenon because the whites were the first slaves into America, and this is admitted by some of the more objective historians, and that's in my book. And then in the 18th century, as black enslavement came more to the fore, there was an attempt to enslave American Indians. That was largely a failure. They were constantly trying to escape and resist. And then by the 19th century, you could say that indentured servitude actually did have meaning and integrity. For example, uh, Johnson, Lincoln's vice president, was an indentured servant uh, in North Carolina, and there was a reward put out for him when he ran away. Now, he actually was serving. uh, Andrew Johnson actually was serving as an indentured servant. He was he was whipped by the white ruling class who were slaveholders. And it's one of the reasons why people like Johnson became what was known as the border white constituency, which was critical to the success of Lincoln in fighting the South. These were uh, poor whites who were mad as hell at the uh, white, the black slavery in the South because it it um, delegitimized white labor. White labor uh, trying to compete against slave labor is almost always going to lose. And in fact, and I know I digress here, but just very briefly, another constituency for Lincoln was David Wilmot's Free Soil Party. Uh, Many of the men motivated to fight in the American Civil War did so for white separatist or one could even say white supremacist reasons. And uh, part of that was the concept that if uh, the Confederacy succeeded and, and black slavery remained intact in the South, that it would expand into places like Oregon, California, and Idaho, where whites crowded into the eastern seaboard uh, cities really saw that as a place to be able to uh, be free and pursue uh, their uh, dreams there without having to compete with slave labor. So these are things policed out of this ridiculously uh, two-dimensional portrait of the uh, American war between the states. But as I say, I digress. (laughs) All right now, these were. What about the term indentured servants? Then we often hear that oh, it was not as bad as it was, as it was for the blacks and all that, right? It was a. But what when I began looking into this, it seems like there was a different, uh, you know, value put on on different people for different reasons in terms of what conditions they could work under. For example, if they had a 
a, a time period on their head that, okay, you are to work for, you know, five years or seven years or whatnot as an indentured servant. They were worked in some cases even harder due to this fact. And they were, many of them did not make it out uh, alive. And those were the type of conditions. I, f I feel that this has been uh, heavily marginalized to a certain degree to kind of uh, brush it over and say, ah, well, it wasn't so bad for those who were whites. So any comments on that, Michael? Well, how many came over as indentured servants to begin with? How many came over with a contract? That would be one question. And how many came over with no contract at all because they were stolen off the streets of Glasgow and London and all the major port cities uh, in, in Great Britain at that time? Secondly, even for those who had indentures, oftentimes it wasn't worth the paper that it was written on. Uh, these people needed you for more labor and so they would find a way to extend your indentures. One of the punishments for being disobedient, one of the punishments for not showing up for work, one of the punishments for running away would be an extension of your indentures. So some of the people who were sent over on a contract of seven years, for example, the biblical figure of seven years, actually served for 10, 15, 20 years, and that could be a lifetime because of the grueling, brutal conditions under which they serve. So if you were 30 years old and you went over there on a seven-year contract, but you ended up being enslaved for 20 because they kept adding time on as a punitive measure, you could easily die as a slave. And when I looked at the diaries and letters and other primary research that were sent either home to uh, survivors in Great Britain or that we found extant, extant in North America, we see that in many, many cases that the indentured servitude concept, especially in the 17th century, was virtually worthless. The vast majority of these people were exploited and enslaved. And what the propaganda sees on is the individual that was lucky enough, the very rare individual to be taken into the plantation house Maybe they were extremely literate and they did some writing for the master. They did the accounting books. And then at the end of five or seven years, they themselves became wealthy or became a judge. But that's a story that has been overworked in this epic. And the actual reality is very different from that minority uh, story that has become the overwhelming false narrative uh, for indentured servitude. Yeah, it's it's very very interesting this uh, history and and highly uh, kept out of the history books. I mean, and a kind of a follow on from this as well. Then as we go deeper into this, I, I think I heard you elsewhere. It was actually a great uh, interview done by the brave uh, Ernst Zundel. Uh, he was interviewing you many years ago. It's available on YouTube, by the way. A great interview there about this topic as well. And you mentioned that you bring the good news to uh, to black people as well that they are not merely just a you know a, a slave race as it's kind of in to a certain degree being portrayed today in, in in the media of today this is something that occurred to every other race uh it's it's also of course a good news to white people that uh they are not solely responsible and and more guilty because of this for any you know for any other reasons how do you view race relations and what has occurred here and how, how the history the historical cover-up has you know played a, a big role in this well, blacks are heavily targeted. They're just as much targeted as whites are, but in a very different way. First of all, with being what, uh, with being complimented all the time and by, by being told how wonderful you are. You know, for those of us who are parents, and I'm a parent, when I'm raising my children, I'm not always telling them that everything they do is perfect and good. Naturally, I want to be constructive and positive, but I'm telling them also, I'm reminding them of, look at the person that is ahead of you. And, and don't be saddled with the concept that I can't get ahead of because of unfair circumstances which have been imposed on me. Any parent who allows their child, to the extent that we have control over our children, to adopt such a crippling philosophy, that child is probably not going to be a success in life. And so what is being imposed on black people is something very similar to that that they have a set of disabilities from which they're not going to be able to overcome until they're uh, paid reparations or, or whatever the case may be, whatever the solution is said to be. And also, for example, in the area of education, the you know, black education in America is substandard, even in places like Oakland, California, where black supremacists or black power people are running the educational system because they're imposing ebonics on black people, in other words, improper grammar and actually saying that that's the best way to speak. The schools for black people should be teaching Shakespeare, Latin, Greek, calculus, and emphasizing discipline. Anyone who truly loved them would do that. 
And at the same time, they are under, as you say, as you brought up, and I'm glad that you brought that point up, they are un they bear this onerous burden, and it's more psychological and sub rosa than actually stated. Mm -hmm. You are the slave race. You are the main race that was captured and seized and exploited in this manner. And therefore, subconsciously and psychologically, the person who's told that has to feel that they have a genetic defect inside of them. And that is not the case. Some of that comes from Talmudic and, and Judaic sources as well, which was an inspiration in some cases for uh, white, white slavers to identify the black race with uh, Ham or one of the uh, descendants of Noah uh, in, yeah. in, in the famous section there. But anyway, uh, yes, they are being exploited in, in this way, and they're being given this sense of entitlement, and that's not what you want to do to advance the people. And here in the United States, we're watching as Asian immigrants are pouring into the country, learning the language very quickly, going to university, occupying the higher echelons uh, in the United States, and black people continue to be left behind. I refuse to believe it's because they can't do it, but I believe that the Asians are not saddled with this entire plethora of psychologically crippling uh, material that has been imposed on blacks, and the idea that uh, if we can let them understand that white people also suffered horribly, were also betrayed by their own people, I think that that benefits anybody, everybody. And you know what? The truth always benefits everyone. So whether or not we can say that this it has a nice outcome, I, my goal is to radically pursue the truth wherever it leads, whatever toes it steps on. But I think in this case, it leads to a good outcome. Yeah, I think you're right. I mean, historical accuracy, that is uh, the number one priority here, to, to, to cover up, to make uh, people feel better, even if it's done for the fact of they think that this is, you know, for the for the welfare of, of people. I think it's not, that the lies is going to harm more people, and I think it's more it's better to just be brutally honest about it, and, and let's face the reality for what it is. But uh, it's also, of course, about the creation of a victim class, a, a victim mentality, which is a very, uh, another powerful tool. But Let's just talk for a moment about how many uh, of the uh, Africans actually how they ended up in the American colonies and what you know. I don't know if you're a specialist on this per se, but uh, we know, of course, with the tie-in with the, uh, the the Arab slave trade, uh, there were uh, Jewish merchants who were part of uh, this process as well. It wasn't like you have a situation where people went out in the in the African bush, white people, uh, you know, threw a net over a couple over a couple of people and and hauled them off to the ships and 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 sailed them over to the Americas or you know Barbados or Bahamas or what have you. This was a very established uh, you know merchant network that was very uh, in some cases of course he had had other you know black tribes fighting with each other and they in some cases captured their enemy and sold them to the Arabs and then some of the Jews owned some of the sh the merchant ships etc. It's a very uh, it, it's a much more complicated view than the very simplified myopic one we're getting in today in the media, correct? Yes, and I'd like to add here, again, trying to have some fidelity for the truth, that I see very little Judaic role in white enslavement. I just wanted to make that point. Mm -hmm. uh, I was surprised by that fact. It was it was mainly whites selling their own whites. Um, Yes, uh, you know, I refer people to one of the best historians uh, for black enslavement is Eugene Genovese, and uh, he also partnered with his wife. He wrote six or eight books. Roll Jordan Roll is probably the prime one that I recommend for people. Uh, he started out as a Marxist, was professor of history at the University of Rochester in upstate New York, had a, a rather interesting peregrination as a scholar continually reacting to new information, which is really the revisionist mandate, and then changing his views as he got better and better information until he finally developed toward the end into uh, quite a sympathizer for our point of view. So I recommend that as a fundamental text, almost any of the books of Genovese. And he was so honest that even when he was a Marxist, uh, he released uh, anomalous information that I was able to use uh, a little bit in my book, especially about the 19th century era. But Certainly, uh, we see even today in Africa, uh, Keith Richburg wrote a book. He was a reporter for the Washington Post a few, about a decade or so ago. Uh, out of Africa, he called it. He was based in Africa, and he said, he made the incredible statement that if I, if my ancestors had not been captured and sold into black slavery in America, I would have been one of the bloated bodies that I saw washing over the waterfall 
whether it was Victoria Falls, I can't recall, in Africa. Hmm. In other words, the uh, fratricide and tribal warfare continues in those areas. And undoubtedly, the media is covering up the extent to which the type of slavery, when, when I give talks at colleges and I talk about white slavery, they think I'm talking about sexual trafficking because that's that's uh, pretty much all they're familiar with. Yeah. But certainly in terms of black women and children being sexually trafficked into a type of sexual slavery, but also chattel slavery itself is still present in Africa. It just isn't being covered by the media. So in 300 years, we have not seen a lot of changes in Africa because of this, both the religious divide, the sectarian divide between Muslims and Christians, but the even more uh, severe divide, which is tribal. And uh, I wouldn't know how many hundreds or thousands of tribes there are in Africa, many of them uh, existing in mutual hatred, murderous hatred for one another. Uh, but this was certainly what obtained in the 17th century, and they were more than willing to take a, a, what they regarded as a subhuman member of another tribe and sell them en masse. And uh, in the Amistad case in the 19th century, where a supposedly white supremacist U.S. Supreme Court with only one dissenting vote, Spielberg did a movie about it. And it <laughs> yeah. so if you fast forward through the sadomasochistic scenes that he seems to delight in, um, actually, it, it's a feather in the cap of white people because um, people like John Quincy Adams, who was a great opponent of uh, the Freemasons in America, very little is said about that, even in a new biography of him, it skipped over. Huh. But he was the one who argued on behalf of the, bl the blacks who had been taken by Spanish slavers. And it was it, so even eight out of the nine members of the Supreme Court, allegedly white supremacists in this era, this antebellum era of America, voted in favor of those black slaves because they felt that the Spanish, what they had done was illegal. But you see that when you see the account of the Amistad blacks, when they are returned to Africa, their families are gone. And even Spielberg had to report that. The mm -hmm. families were either killed in internecine warfare or sold into slavery. And this is what, the 1830s, somewhere in that era. Right. And so this is a continuing, I, I'm not an authority on uh, the enslavement of blacks, but this is a continuing aspect of that culture and how we override it, to what extent, I'm not sure. But certainly, there has to be a greater emphasis on the partnership that existed between these uh, white and Judaic merchants and the uh, black slavers of, of uh, Africa. Now, let's dwell on the Amistad, not that case particularly, but uh, that as being focused upon as a movie and others that have consequently come out, uh, tremendously praised uh, movies and, and highly rewarded and uh, you know Oscars and all that stuff. We have uh, 12... 12 Years a Slave, you have, you have the butler and everything else that's coming out. And a lot of people, they don't get their history from reading, you know, totems of, of academic uh, inquiries into history. They actually get it from a lot of pop culture. Uh, and it's done in this way. In your view, Michael, how, how is Hollywood uh, exacerbating the situation? Why are they doing this? Is it is it a political agenda behind this? Or, or what is this about, do you think? They have to be self-destructive in the end because it's it's kind of a conundrum to me in that the white race today in Europe and North America, Australia, Canada is largely become the golem of the is Israelis and uh, and and so you don't really understand why when the Israelis need these whites to stand as a bulwark against uh, everything that the Israelis are trying to do in the greater Middle East or what they call Eretz Israel. Um, because you're creating this self-destructive self-hatred. And one of the first symptoms of that is going to be, and we do have a, a large degree of this, is forms of self-extinction, suicide, high suicide rates among young whites, uh, explosive destructive drug use of drugs that uh, debilitate and kill people, and also uh, uh, most astonishingly and most destructively in the very low birth rate, uh, whites just not willing to reproduce themselves, which is the extent all the way across the globe. And th there has to be a connection between whites being portrayed in these movies like 12 Years a Slave. I refuse to see it uh, because I'm not a masochist. So I'm not going to sit through this nonsense. I don't know whether they're, uh, whether the movie says that these were one or two white slavers who engaged in this horrendous uh, sadism against black people. 
but whoever it was, it would have been a tiny one-tenth one of one percent. The overwhelming reality of black enslavement in America was, was fundamentally benevolent in the sense that, first of all, they were very expensive property. Secondly, they were in a Christian society. Even when Mark Twain, who was anti-slavery, depicted Jim in the book Huckleberry Finn, Jim was not going through these things. Uh, what about the support for the Confederacy among many blacks, far more that have been uh, brought forward today? Uh, the, the, the almost love affair between blacks and whites that existed in the South at this time. White Southerners understood and knew black people better than people in the North did. So there's all these interstices and interconnections which militate against this portrayal as if virtually every white slave owner was whipping his slave to death or using them in the most cruel uh, possible way. Yep. And then there are no films about seeing the types of being whipped to death and being worked to death that white people uh, endured under under white slavery. It's very unfortunate, but no, I can't really make sense out of the fact that this crippling uh, this crippling guilt is being imposed on whites at the same by a largely Judaic Hollywood, which more and more they're admitting uh, today in such books as How the Jews Invented Hollywood by I believe the author Neil Gabler. Neil Gabler, but, yeah. Yeah. So more and more they're admitting this. Uh, they're controlling this agenda. And yet, uh, why would they want that? I mean, don't they need the U.S. Marines to uh, to help uh, fortify their oppression of the Palestinians? And the, <laughs> yeah. Well, in general, the anti-immigrant parties, I mean, you might be more familiar than I am be, being a European yourself, but the anti-immigration parties in Europe seem to be more and more identified with uh, the Israelis. So this yeah, is what I call, unfortunately. I call a golem type of operation. Uh, these are becoming their golem, and, and you'd think they would want to build them up in case they really do need them, because otherwise, you know, it's a tiny little statelet over there in a sea of Arabs. But uh, <laughs> it's very difficult to figure. I myself don't inflict it. I did watch Amistad, as I said. I went through the sadomasochistic parts, but uh, being a uh, fan of John Quincy Adams, I, I thought that Spielberg's portrayal was very interesting. Maybe it even backfired on him because the Supreme Court and Adams worked so hard for those black people. And you don't really see that in, in other cultures. I would like to see the extent to which uh, some of the uh, other cultures that are so hostile to our people would be so fair to us. There's this idea that we've been overwhelmingly oppressive, but in many ways America has extended opportunity, and so has Europe, opportunities to other races which are just not available in sub-Saharan Africa or even parts of Asia where people are clearly racialistically identified, and if you're not part of their tribe, you're, you're pretty much at it. Yeah, yeah, well, exactly. Yeah, it's it's very interesting. Uh, guilt is, a, of course, a tremendously powerful tool, and when this is used in injunction with creation of a victim class, you have a, a, a per, pretty a uh, volatile cocktail there, I think, and I, I think that this is being done for for uh, different purposes of of control, etc., and and using this in 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 various ways politically and what have you. And I think we're, due to the political correctness and everything else, um, it's it's very decapacitating on 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 so many different fronts, you know. But uh, and we can certainly talk more about that too. It's just you know again how this is being used and what the reasons are. But uh, just a couple of other points here as well in terms of breaking the. Um, this very myopic view that it was just very uh, one-sided here. The the Cherokee, for example, they they ha held slaves. I mean, the whole idea of even South versus North, uh, the the American Civil War and everything else, uh, the, over the fact that this was about slavery. There are a lot of things here that doesn't actually make sense once you begin to deconstruct it. And um, I mean, very few, as you said, percentage in the South actually did held uh, hold slaves, and yet despite this, to this day. Uh, all white people, even if you arrived in the, you know, <laughs> the families arrived in the in the late 1900s, you know, they're still uh, kind of part of of being uh, the the responsible party for this. But um, what can we say about something like the Cherokee, for example? They hold holding slaves, and are there other anomalies like this that kind of uh, break this bubble that we've been uh, set up for? Well, sure, the Choctaw, the Cherokee, what were called the civilized tribes, many of them uh, having. Uh, characteristics of whites in terms of their appearance. If you see photographs of them, uh, even Joseph Brandt, uh, who was said to be Iroquois, uh, has strong white features in his portraits. But yes, they fought for the Confederacy, the Cherokee Rifles, the Choctaw, 
Uh, there was, uh, I believe, Stan Wadey was a Confederate general and a full-blooded American Indian, and they did hold slaves. And there are even uh, cases of uh, free blacks who owned blacks uh, in antebellum America. And you also have the situation where now in the United States, uh, the Confederate flag is uh, more and more being outlawed, and uh, they're attempting to suppress it. And a lot of, unfortunately, black people are behind this when it's a clear part of our American heritage, and it's supposed to be the idea, well, the stars and bars, the American flag, it represents liberty, and then the Confederate flag represents uh, slavery. Well, I believe both flags, to me, represent undaunted courage under fire. In both cases, I think of the soldiers who fought each other to a standstill there uh, with remarkable fortitude. And as an American, I stand for the... Uh, for our national anthem, and I put my hand over my heart when our flag waves, even though I know a lot of bad things have been done in our name, but I think of the valor of the soldiers who fought for that flag. Well, my point is, is that if the flag of the United States of America is so vastly superior to the Confederate flag, how is it that many of the top Union generals, Lincoln's heroic liberating generals, at the end of the Civil War, went on to exterminate the American Indians. I mean, what exactly did Sherman and Sheridan and Custer, every one of them Union generals, what did they do at the end of the war? They went right off and destroyed Indian villages, killed them by the thousands, waving the American flag under that. The South had a symbiotic relationship, very positive with American Indians in their domain. And I do not believe the American Confederacy would have treated Indians the way the Union North did. And again, this is policed out of the agenda. So I completely reject the idea of demonization of the South and glorification of the North. The Civil War itself could have been avoided. There was no need to kill 600,000 white men. Slavery was doomed anyway. And I believe there was a hidden hand behind that war, both among the fire breathers in the South who refused to compromise with the North, such as George Fitzhugh, the founder of the science of sociology, who wrote a book called Sociology for the South. And also in the North, the hardcore uh, abolitionist uh, radicals, both of them seeking a massive fratricide. And in the end, uh, to me, it's like looking at World War I, where we're now at our 100th anniversary. I, I can't find any good on either side when the core of the whole thing was fratricide, that absolutely my bottom line is to avoid fratricide. As Ben Franklin said, there never was a good war or a bad peace. And uh, we may not apply that in every situation, but I would apply that to the American Civil War and to World War I. Yeah, yeah, indeed. Now, uh, we're going to take a short break here, Michael, before we proceed in the next segment. I have a lot of more, more questions for you and points, points I want to bring up here as well. But let's talk about your website a little bit and, of course, the book where people can get a hold of this for themselves uh, to pick up a copy. The uh, title is They Were White and They Were Slaves, uh, The Untold History of the Enslavement of Whites in Early America. Uh, and of course, last time, by the way, we were with us, we talked about, I believe, your latest book, The uh, uh, Usury in Christendom as well. Uh, tell us about your website where people can pick up copies of your books and please uh, mention other uh, titles and, and publications you have available as well. Oh, thank you. The website is revisionisthistory.org, and uh, some of the other books are uh, Judaism, Strange Gods, The Great Holocaust Trial. You mentioned Ernst Zundel. Uh, that was my report on that. And I'm also at work on a new one called The Occult Renaissance Church of Rome, which should be available in early 2015. Oh, interesting. That sounds very interesting. Now, revisionisthistory.org is the website uh, do check it out. We're going to have the links up on our website as well, so you can click through easily from there. And also check out the uh, Revisionist History uh, newsletter as well that you can get from the website right there. All right, we'll take a short break. Stay with us, Michael. We'll be right back. Well, folks, don't miss the second hour as we continue to discuss slavery, how it's being used today to justify guilt imposed on Europeans, and also the economic incentives behind it with uh, Michael Hoffman. We begin to talk about how and why it's been excluded from the history books for such a long time. We talk about racism as a fairly new concept. We discuss white privilege, political correctness, the charges against the West and the defense of it. We also uh, discuss birth rates, immigration and the decadence of the liberalism of the left and the critique of the right. Well, much more good stuff is coming up. Don't miss it. Join us at Red Ice 
members.com. We have much more to discuss, so sign up and tune in. We have a lot of material there for you that you can stream or download. We have more shows coming up, of course. We have uh, John Rappaport, Kevin McDonald, Dennis Fetcho, John DeNugent, Veronica Clark, Susan Lindauer, and others with us ahead as well. Well, thank you for listening, but we'll be right back with more. In the realm of what I hope to get into later on in the broadcast, the uh, impressment of white slaves aboard British naval and maritime vessels, Granville Sharp was also someone who underscored this hypocrisy. So that was really the main thing, and also the crippling effects of guilt on white people who are told that they are the heirs and the descendants of these horrible people who enslaved the blacks. Well, what about the whites themselves who are being targeted in this fashion, and they are actually the descendants of white slaves, especially here in North America, and they're not even aware of it. Absolutely, exactly. It's uh, it, it opens up this debate in a completely different way. Certainly, later I want to talk more about how this is being used, you know, today and for what reason and whatnot. There's a very important aspect to this and how this is uh, changing the, the the landscape in your view in terms of uh, you know race relations in America and all that. Who that has been uh, intensified, I, I think, really over the years here. But I mean, all of you focus, and we'll get to that later. But all of you focus on on the Americas quite a bit in the book, and and obviously uh, the Edited press and the author of six books on radical history, journalism, and literature. He uh, describes himself as a heretical writer. Hoffman is the managing editor of the newsletter Revisionist History, and his book that we'll be discussing today is called They Were White and They Were Slaves. And welcome back, Michael Hoffman. It's uh, excellent to have you here again. Thank you for coming on. It's always a pleasure speaking with you. Hope you're doing well today. Thank you very much for having me, Henry. You bet. Well, today we're going to talk about your book, They Were White and They Were Slaves, The Untold History of the Enslavement of Whites in Early America. And this is, I mean, such a hidden and and, and neglected subject. I mean, I couldn't believe it myself when I started uh, coming on to some of the work on this, including your book on the subject, of course. Uh, This is a historical cover-up, no no questions about there, that has uh, certainly been a myopic view on history solely, in some cases, divided on racial lines uh, by the corporate media and the opportunists in in government, I'd say as well, who seeks to use uh, some of this to fulfill their own political agendas. But uh, the book has been out for many years. Greetings, folks. Thank you for tuning in here today. It's good to have you here. I'm Henrik from Sweden, and this is Red Ice Radio. I hope you're having a good week so far. The website where you can find more shows, news, and videos is redicecreations.com. And uh, today here we have a history lesson for you, another one of those items that we think it's really important to address due to the fact that it is suppressed and neglected. Tremendously important, in fact, for the sake of historical accuracy and what is going on today. We'll be talking about white slavery, something that is never discussed and put in the proper context. And uh, with us to bring light to this subject that has been hiding in the shadows for way too long is Michael Hoffman, a uh, former reporter for the Associated... ...pooned in his book, uh, Bleak House, which he called uh, telescopic philanthropists in that they could They could see the misery of blacks in Africa or in the U.S., but they couldn't see the misery of their own poor whites right underneath their windowsills. And this was a great concern of Charles Dickens. He had very little use for the politically correct attitudes that we have today. And I'm often surprised when the BBC inserts uh, black actresses playing white parts in Dickens novels in the programs that they broadcast. Uh, He would have had a strong objection to this. And let's not be faint-hearted when we discuss aspects of this. These were men of their time, certainly, perhaps captive to the zeitgeist. But nonetheless, let's bear uh, witness to what they actually represented so that if we admire Dickens for his great literary abilities, perhaps we should also explore his political and uh, moral understandings of these situations. So Dickens was uh, a great one for underscoring this hypocrisy, and Granville Sharp, now, Michael, back in uh, you know mid mid to early '90s was released. So I hope we can refresh your memory here a bit as well. But tell us first why you wanted to write this book and why you think it's an important subject. 
Well, it was basically uh, the issue of hypocrisy. I start out the book with a quote from Shakespeare, now step I forth to whip hypocrisy. And that's really what it is, the overwhelming emphasis on uh, black chattel enslavement, which I don't wish to minimize what happened to black people in the Western Hemisphere in terms of their enslavement is a horror. Uh, but my concern is with filling in uh, a gap, and that gap is the equal horror of white enslavement and the fact that s many of the people who were involved in liberating uh, black people from slavery were also implicated in the enslavement of blacks or, or and, excuse me, in the enslavement of whites or turning a blind eye to the enslavement of whites. For example, the 19th century Victorian campaigners in Great Britain uh, who uh, the Charles Dickens land